Our first workshop today will be presented by Julian Joseph. Julian has been working in data science for the last seven years, wearing multiple hats from a developer to an advocate or even a product manager. More recently, she has been working at Google in the data science and data analytics team of Google Cloud. She has been a WIDS ambassador since 2017 and has a podcast of her own focusing on women leading businesses. Julian's workshop is entitled Data Science and Retail Industry. She will pause during her talk at designated spots to take questions from the audience. Please welcome Julian. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on a Wednesday morning. I know you all have a very busy schedule. I'll just quickly share my screen and we should get started soon. You can see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I thought I'd just begin today uh, with a thought that's really uh, close to my heart. It says data is a tool for enhancing inclusion. And all of us know it's a new oil, everybody's collecting data, but how does it help us in real world? And we're gonna focus mostly on e-commerce platforms today, um, given that it is so widespread. And thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. Um, this is just a very quick intro from my side as as in what companies I was working with. I was working with two startups before Google Cloud and uh, most of my uh, products have been B2B, business to business, and they've been in the healthcare or the retail industry. A large part of it has been retail, so that's why I chose retail, but that does not mean that data science can be applied anywhere else. But we're gonna be focusing on e-commerce specifically today. Uh, I love being a part of such communities. I did see a lot of you are in Vancouver. Uh, so I'm currently, uh, in working as a part of Data Can, uh, which is a nonprofit organization in Vancouver. And I've been, I love being a, a champion for women in this field. So since we're short on time, let's quickly move on to our agenda. But today we'll be walking through the, some of the real world applications for machine learning. Uh, and we'll see uh, what, you know, if you can recognize whether or not uh, you, you, you understand that the things that you see in real world have machine learning behind them or not. Uh, we'll try to understand in detail how it is being implemented in retail, in the retail industry. Uh, and most importantly, understand how to interpret those results. And I'll also touch a little bit about uh, uh, what are the best practices while you're implementing this on scale. Uh, so in, in be it a startup, be it as, uh, as big as Google, we have a lot of different ways to, uh, uh, you know, carry out implementing of data science in scale. So I, have, I am keeping an eye on the chat and I would love all of you to take a look at these pictures one by one. The first one here, and let me know what you think about these. Has any one of you seen these and what do you think are you know, some of the reasons uh, this is happening. So for example, you have uh, the Amazon recommendations. So when you, so for example, you buy a pen, the moment you buy a pen, you might actually come up at the very bottom say, seeing this thread, which says customers who have bought this or you purchased a book, you would also see customers have bought this item, also bought another item, and they would have a list of these items. And um, please let me know if you've seen these things. Yeah, I, I do see people saying, um, you know, it is, a, it is because of the recommendation systems that are implemented at Amazon. Um, similarly, we do see uh, this on our social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat and, and TikTok. So being in the data field for so long and you'd come to realize that, oh, this is all an algorithm that is suggesting all of this. So maybe nerds like me, if you are, uh, you would, you know, go ahead and, and, and click those three dots uh, on, a, on a suggested post, which you never wanted to see, or, you know, just were curious, like, why is this coming on my feed? Maybe you've clicked on those three dots and seen um, hide that post. I don't want to see a suggested post. So how many of you have done that? Uh, feel free to pour it on the chat and um, I, I can definitely take a look at that. So maybe you can you know, snooze those, those suggested posts as well. 
The other thing you see is uh, the fit the ads. So not all ads are bad because sometimes um, oh one one thing is that ads that you see as a part of your Google search is also very much catered to every user. So for example, uh, uh, an athlete might see a very different uh, ad versus a computer scientist like me. So, or, or, or uh, say Laura being, being uh, the professor, she would, see, she would see, you know, based on her location, based on what she's been watching or searching, her ads would be different and catered specifically to her. And um, like you all know, Absolutely. Thank you so much for pouring it out on the chat. Uh, I, I love seeing that you all have seen these things and there is ML behind each of these and we'll actually deep dive into all of the reasons why these things are happening, right? So let's, let's begin our workshop with a very small data set of retail industry. This is very easily available in the uh, platform Kaggle. I, I hope you're, you know, you're always spending your time on GitHub or Kaggle. This is very easily available. It's a 4KB data set. And um, I know this is not what the real world data set would look like, but I just want to introduce a certain concept that is being used with the small data set first. And obviously when, you, when you're working as a data scientist or a data engineer, you would have petabytes of data. It could not be 4KB, never. Uh, but you will have a similar uh, distribution of the data set. So here we have customer ID. Uh, we have uh, which gender the customer is uh, identifying themselves by their age, the annual income and the spending scores. These are the few columns that we have. And what's the first thing that we uh, do uh, as soon as this happens is definitely that a, a data scientist would want to keep their minds on. But this is our objective, you know, before uh, you go ahead and, and say, for example, you are working in, at H&M or Aridzia. I saw somebody saying that they are from Vancouver. Now, Aritzia is a very famous store here. I just moved six months ago. So this is that is one place that I'm familiar with. But let's say you are a data scientist or a machine learning engineer at Aritzia, uh, and you want to, you have been tasked with uh, the this uh, a data set that looks like this. Uh, and you have to come up with outcomes like these. Uh, find out which customer is interested in which item or which of these set of customers would have a tendency to spend more or less than a certain number so that they can you know, understand which are the products that I should price differently, which are the products that should go on sale. You know, Sometimes quotes are on sale even though it's not the right season. And you might wonder why. There are definitely data teams uh, working behind uh, all of that and trying to understand what happens uh, when you when you change these prices based on the data that they collect? So keep in mind that when customers come in uh, in real life, they do not you know come in with a with a with a tag on their head saying that you know I am a customer that falls in this particular segmentation. You know we don't have any categories or labels on the customer data in real life. So we make use of the uh, unsupervised machine learning to group whatever unlabeled data we have into possible user categories or customer categories so that marketing campaigns can actually be targeted directly at those customer segments. So this is the crux of our uh, workshop today. We are trying to understand how companies go ahead and perform audience segmentation in retail industries. So let's, let's try to understand what do they use for that. So as you all know, uh, or, or maybe not, but one of the first things that uh, any data scientist would do is to run a data EDA or exploratory data analysis and try to understand how does your data look like. So as you remember, we had two main uh, columns, that is uh, two, I mean, we had five columns. If we were to just do a very simple matplotlib of that particular uh, data set for age and spending score, this is what it looks like. Um, I'm not showing the code, but uh, it is it is going to be made available to you uh, right after this uh, talk. I'll put it up in the chat as well. But this is a very simple two-liner or three-liner uh, code that, that just helps you plot different columns with uh, respect to each other. So we have age versus spending score in the first one, age versus annual income in the first one. And you can kind of have an, you know, understand what is the, the underlying pattern of uh, uh, different age groups, say 30 to 40 uh, seem to be spending a lot more versus others. 
uh, people like me, of course. Now, when you have, say, spending score versus annual income, you do see there is a certain amount of, uh, you know, different segments are being formed. And this helps you understand what, as a data scientist, you know, what algorithm should you use to come up with the, with the, with the answers that you're looking for or your team is looking for. So clustering algorithm is what we are going to focus on. And uh, there are different types of clustering algorithms, but not everything is practically implementable because it takes time and it's computationally, you require a lot of resources. And when you're working in a company, you have to take, keep in mind what budget you have, uh, you know, allocated for your cloud resources. For... Is, is there any question? Okay. Please, uh, I think maybe your hands. I, can, I do hear an echo, but um, uh, the the four the, the these are the four different categories of uh, clustering algorithms. The first one being hierarchical clustering. Now, hierarchical clustering is is mostly made use of when you know that the data is of certain hierarchy. Say, for example, it's uh, you you do know of um, different kinds of bacteria. There are only five types of bacteria in this world. Or there are only two types of people that come, you know, people who attend the WIDS workshop and people who don't attend the WIDS workshop. So depending upon what is your use case and what is what does your data look like, you can implement a hierarchical clustering. And however, this is uh, not really suitable in, in, in uh, practical scenarios when your data is really large because its complexity is O of uh, N, N cube and it makes it kind of not a good choice. Distributed uh, distribution-based clustering, however, this is works really well when you know the distribution of the data. So for example, the data distribution is Gaussian. Uh, the clustering would have to, you know, would cluster it into three different Gaussian distributions. And as the distance from every single point. So when you when I say points, think about these uh, data, data points that are there. Uh, as the distribution will, you know, increase, the probability that a point belongs to a particular distribution would change. The next clustering algorithm is density-based uh, clustering, which means, you know, you would uh, have, say, uh, high density, all of the data points that are within that high density, they form a certain cluster. And here you'll have arbitrary shaped clusters. You don't have a, a specific round shape or, or a square shaped ones. So when you have high varying densities uh, and high dimensions um, or outliers, don't use this because um, it does not really deal very well with outliers. It would just uh, change the distribution entirely or the density entirely. And the final one that one the one we are going to focus mostly on today is called centroid based uh, clustering, uh, or what is also referred to as K means clustering. So this is super fast, efficient. Uh, depending upon your uh, you know domain knowledge, you could choose the K real uh, a really nice number for K. I don't go and say seven is my favorite number, so K is always going to be equal to uh, seven. Not it doesn't work like that. The more knowledge you have about your use case and domain. Uh, you could actually set uh, K is equal to five. Like I said, like five different uh, bacteria or two different people, kinds of people in this world. Uh, K can be set a certain number and we can iterate over it. Um, so these are the five different steps that happens in a K-means. You would specify a number of clusters. K is equal to, uh, say, let's say we've chosen four based on our understanding of the number of customers that walked into our mall or Eridzia or H&M. And you would randomly initialize the clusters or the centroids uh, for each of these. And each of these data points will uh, be assigned to its closest cluster centroid, okay? So um, I will show you a GIF right after this that helps you understand how does that cluster centroid change. Um, you would keep computing the centroid uh, versus all of the, the, so basically it's like, randomly you've chosen all of the K samples as initial centroids. And imagine that there is a, a point I've chosen at this point, a point here and a point here. So there are five different centroids that I randomly chose. And uh, we keep creating K clusters, that is five here, by assigning each example to its closest centroid. So uh, when you try to average out all of these distances, it's basically Euclidean distance between that centroid versus the point and the distance between each of this. If the centroids don't change, your uh, algorithm can keep continuing. 
it's uh, this thing. So let's let's look at the look, let's look at the visualization. It always helps to see it in action. So it began from iteration zero to it keeps on. We keep on iterating over and seeing, finding out. If you see this, look at this black plus sign. That's your centroid. So it began with a lot of these data points being associated with red, but more and more it keeps moving on and says, no, we've got a different centroid position where this would, the red points have, have actually come, come down to a very small uh, uh, amount of clusters, amount of data points in that cluster. And there is a yellow one, there is a purple one. So um, this is how, and the moment it does not change, if the centroids don't change, we stop our iteration. There is no point in repeating the iteration if you have already figured out the optimal uh, number of clusters. Uh, and this that is that helps us uh, make, mostly it would not change, but uh, there is there are also different uh, statistical methods that you can apply to find the optimal number of uh, clusters to begin with. So this is one of the most famous ones used. I think there's also a, a silhouette based one, but this is more practical. Uh, in, in most of these uh, use cases that I've seen uh, while working at Fractal or somewhere, we've used uh, the elbow plot method. What happens in elbow, elbow plot method is basically um, the, WCSS or cluster inertia. Uh, this is actually what is going to be taken uh, into account whenever this cluster inertia decreases. Uh, it, so most, it, it forms like the, the elbow uh, and the cluster inertia keeps decreasing as we increase the number of clusters. Say for example, uh, the number of clusters you've chosen is 10 or, or six. You can see the, the difference between that inertia is actually less. The moment it actually hits five, from that particular point, in for our example specifically, we know that the drop of the inertia is actually less. So when it becomes, you know, a plateau comes and forms, you would want to choose this particular point as your optimal number of clusters. If you choose uh, three or, or one in this case, it would be a suboptimal one and you would want to iterate over it again and again with a different number for K. So imagining uh, that we have had uh, five as our K is equal to, and we run the model, it's a very small SkyKit learn just implement K means, uh, the code is very simple. Uh, I do not want to uh, scare you or, or, you know, show the cl uh, and then cloud it with uh, the code. But it's again a very uh, small three to four lines of code. Having run that, our data set now will have an additional column added on in addition to age on annual income and spending score called clusters. And every single row or every single customer would be assigned a certain cluster. So this would help us understand. So by adding this 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 uh, cluster, we can also visualize this and using the cluster uh, particular column called cluster, give it a color. You can actually understand. Oh, these are the different types of clusters. Even though you see that there are uh, a few few of the data points are actually uh, coll colliding in that particular area, they are different. Uh, they do fall into different uh, segments it's because of the color. You can understand that they are in a different segment. And uh, what is important uh, during this time uh, and age is because all of this can be automated with the cloud providers, there is Azure uh, ML Studio or Google Cloud has AutoML, all of this can be automated. It is very important that you understand how do you interpret the result. Now that you see that this is the final output of a K-means clustering algorithm, you can understand that um, in the top left corner, all of the customers seem to have, who have a low spending score, even though they have a very high annual income, they uh, do have disposable income, right? They can be targeted uh, by our marketing uh, teams to spend a lot more. So next time you are presenting your, your, your you know, your presentation to your senior members or stakeholders uh, who are having a lot more budget for the marketing campaigns. This, these are the these are the things that you would actually come up and say. So the bottom left customers have a low annual income and they spend less, which makes sense because they're trying to you know fit into their budget. So maybe have mercy on them. <laughs> so uh, the top right, uh, the customers are similar to the bottom left, and their difference is again it's how much budget they have to spend. Bottom right, the yellow customers have they are obviously spending a lot more beyond their budget so they they're doing a great job in in you know considering ourselves to be on the other side you can also visualize this in in your uh, as a 3d model so there are customers who are 
uh, between the ages of 20 to 40 that they are really young at heart. They keep uh, on a slightly older population as well. So the more spending can happen uh, based on these results. Um, I'll, have, I'll take a quick question answer break. I do see Ifat uh, having a question on how do we know it's five, not six, and, and the optimal point. So based on our uh, use case, so now I've shown you a very small data set here. So in this, though, uh, if, if you do end up taking six, you can actually do it. It's, it's always a trial and error and understanding what case should be like. There is no harm in changing uh, k is equal to six and then running your and seeing your results. Uh, if your if your clusters change, if you have a different result, you can. There is absolutely no harm in, in trying this. And K means is a place where actually trial and error helps a lot in deciding the optimum number of clusters. Um, is there another question? What is your thought on not observing improvement on KPIs after using the customer segmentation? Not observing improvement on KPIs. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit more about this, Maddie Tahar? I, I didn't understand which KPIs are we looking for. So uh, mostly as, as product managers, as data scientists, we do have certain objectives in mind, like what are we actually trying to improve as KPIs? And if you have a certain, say, uh, an objective in mind, like maybe in the next three months, as your, your team is trying to definitely improve a certain metric, you can, uh, you know, uh, coordinate your your efforts on the marketing team with your data scientist results, and and uh, help them in a way that you know maybe in order to improve this particular KPI metric, you would want to change your use case. So as your use case changes, the more you talk and collaborate with your team members, you can. Uh, or coordinate more to increase sales. Yeah. So for example, you want to increase sales of a particular segment, say women's coats are not selling a lot. So maybe we should focus on that. And uh, you, so the, 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 the um, columns that I showed you, I did not have any of those SKUs uh, column names. So the real world data, like when I was working in the fractal, we had uh, best buy as our client. So you will have SKUs uh, that talk about each and every single uh, parent and child and what category this particular uh, item SKU is, I think, uh, that particular unit that, where it is placed. I would have the aisle number. I would have the uh, terminal where it was purchased from. I would have data of all kinds, but on in uh, when I am focusing on one single unit that is not being sold or has been sold. And with all of that data, I can actually have a feature store that is helping me understand where, where should I place it. There is feature engineering that can be done. You can focus on different columns, not just these five columns. So do understand that the real world will give you a lot more than this four KBs of data, and that'll help us focus on whichever KPI we're looking for. Um, can we implement clustering for one dimensional data or one continuous measure of scores? Um, by one dimensional data, within the, does it mean like you have just one column? Um, it might, you might end up having inertia of zero, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it, it depends on the use case. Mostly it's like if you have more than a, a few columns, you can actually come up having a, exploring what is the pattern and what 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 lies inside this data to um, maybe I should I should get back to you. Maybe there are some research papers on that. People might have done it. We go crazy with our algorithms and, and we of course want to try out different things. Um, is there yeah. any other question? Wonderful. So as several of you are already doing, please submit your uh, questions into the Q&A. And uh, also, Julian will be available at the end to answer questions in the chat for whatever doesn't get answered. And there will be additional question sections within this talk. I guess, would you like to take one more question? I, I see one in the chat that says, uh, do you always find such nice and well-separated clusters when analyzing groups? It's never the case with our data. We struggle with making sense out of clustering results. Absolutely, yes. So um, 
uh, as you scale and as you have say petabytes of data, like I remember being a data engineer uh, for uh, uh, Fractal and we had petabytes of data coming every week and we had to uh, transform it and first of all, uh, reach a particular situation where, you know, these models come into the picture only after the data engineer has actually transformed the data uh, with with to a particular stage, you cannot go ahead and, and uh, run k-means on uh, the raw data set that you have. Uh, you might want to, uh, in scale, you know, make sure. So, for example, if your if your team is making use of data warehouses, you would want to store the data that you are definitely going to require for your models. Uh, in that particular subset or the views, you might have to. Uh, so, for example, we have returns. Uh, in retail, uh, after say 30 days, you would have the return of the same item that was sold in the first of your month on the day 30, it is, it is returned. So you would want to run aggregates and, and make sure that your uh, what you're looking at is actually the correct subset or the correct cross-section of data, and then use that uh, to be sent into your, your model pipeline. We'll get into that and how, how you should actually uh, separate out your uh, data into a more cleaner form. Uh, so you would move from bronze to uh, silver to gold. There are different stages as you scale. Uh, before you implement k-means, you would definitely want to go ahead and, and try to maybe uh, clean it out a little bit and, and give a good good subsection of data too, so that you can get a better result. I hope that answers your question. Um, do we have anything else? When we have TBs of data, how do we do to EDA effectively? Yeah, uh, again, like I mentioned, so you don't, um, so, do, so uh, before the data scientist comes into the picture, the data engineer does a lot of transformations and uh, run PySpark scripts and jobs to be able to, to be able to, you know, provide a good, good quality data to the data scientist. And that is where they run that, but um, it's not usually run on uh, petabytes of data on, on every single thing, like you would, <laughs> you would spend a lot of time uh, unnecessarily going through all of those different visualizations. Not like you uh, you can't just open sheets and, and run visualizations on that. So uh, once you know uh, the domain and what you have to focus on based on the use case, say for example, uh, I was working on a predictive analytics uh, segment for Somnoware, the second startup that I was working for, they were trying to predict whether the patient will actually use the sleep apnea mask or not. Uh, for how much longer the doctor has prescribed. So I had to understand what, what CPAP machines are, what are their, uh, uh, you know, reporting minutes, or is it in times, or is it in seconds? And I had to understand what are, what is a hospital looking for. So more domain knowledge that you have, you can actually choose what you want to focus on and then run uh, based on that, run an ADA based on those uh, uh, specific columns that you want to look at. Um... Your example is limits to two variable analysis. What type of analysis is done when more than two variables are involved? Uh, I guess you're referring to EDA again. And uh, there is definitely often much more computer friendly function, therefore making this a valuable method. Is there is there a, a question we can play? Come across data when every row. I think somebody is not on mute. About attributes of that subject. I can't hear you. Uduja, could you speak up? There are other times when the information. Oh, uh, Rituja is our next speaker. Hold on. We'll roles. try to address this now. Each role has one attribute about that subject. So, um, can I can I just try to quickly? I, can I get back to these two questions afterwards? Is that absolutely? Okay? Yes. Okay. Please continue. Yeah. I'll just quickly cover other parts and then I'll come back. Um, now, the I just wanted to introduce that uh, you two, the K-means is not the only thing that we make use of in retail uh, or e-commerce websites. So market basket analysis is a very commonly used uh, algorithm. It is very basic uh, eighth grade mathematics. If you, if you just search for market basket analysis, you would have a very simple uh, probability coming up. And this is what helps us decide 
where should a particular item be placed on uh, when you go for shopping you would see say butter being placed next to uh, cheese or yogurt or, or bread and butter is placed together and there is a certain science behind this and that is what is market basket analysis so you've all gone through uh, those um, case studies maybe you've heard when 1992 there was a they tried to find a correlation between the sales of beer versus and the sales of diapers I, there was some weird logic that parents used to, you know, shop both both of them together. So data was collected and tried to we tried to make you make sense out of that data, uh, and and this is being very frequently implemented. It is not just in the uh, physical space. I I would love to see anybody put up on the chat. You know, how do you think uh, a market basket analysis is implemented in the world today in the in our online shopping areas? Uh, where have you seen market basket analysis? It helps us, you know, put up these things together. Like, okay, maybe there is a pattern, like a lot of customers who purchased uh, bread, they also want a Greek yogurt. So let's keep them, uh, you know, parallelly, like put, put the Greek yogurts in a freezer here and put all of the bread uh, that was bought here. Maybe, or, or, or cucumbers were placed next to um, uh, celery because a lot of people who have purchased this thing before have, would, have also purchased this here. Any guesses on what this would look like? Correct. Thank you so much. Amazon. Uh, so the first picture that you had seen, uh, customers who bought this also bought that, is also making use of market basket analysis. Uh, again, a very simple algorithm. It's nothing very complex. And Azure M uh, ML Studio actually automates all of this. It's just a playground now. You can just drag and drop a market basket analysis. And, and all you need to know is how to interpret those results. Um, the next very commonly used uh, uh, algorithm is naive ways. So how many of you use Gmail? I hope a lot of you do. So when you, if you have seen Gmail uh, trying to uh, mark, this, is, this may be spam or this may not be spam, that is making use of naive ways. So naive ways algorithm is again, uh, something that helps you do classification on a very, it's a, it is again a simple algorithm. It is not that complex, but uh, the Instagram image that you had seen initially, uh, it tries to make use of naive ways to uh, classify maybe, you know, this, this is the kind of post that she or he might like uh, based on your uh, likes before. And that helps you improve the feed and give you meaningful ads. So it is a very similar concept that is made use of in our real world scenarios today. So it's not just retail, I was also trying to uh, include, you know, it's social media or networks. Others can also make use of, uh, again, the same simple algorithms. And of course, uh, again, back to retail, I just realized that that is uh, something that is not also, uh, my examples are not, not for retail, but here we come back to retail. That is the lifetime value prediction. So um, a lot of the sales for a lot of the companies, uh, there's this uh, honest, uh, statistic that says 80% of your sales comes from 20% of your customers. And it actually pays to make a good relationship with those 20% customers. So when you're able to identify that with all of your uh, analysis and models that you've run, you can actually uh, create, uh, this, so this is a very, very basic lifetime value prediction is actually a, a commonly uh, targeted um, objective uh, for any retail segmentation. Uh, you would have to, use linear regression to come up with this LTV value. Uh, it's, sh it's short for LTV, uh, full form for, for LTV. And it helps you predict what are your, your values for uh, each and every uh, customer, whether or not this particular customer would be a loyal customer or not. So uh, linear regression is again, the one of the basic machine learning algorithms. It's a straight line, basically MS, uh, M MX plus C. And there's also a lot of optimization that you can do for linear regression, lasso, ridge. So um, we made use of this a lot uh, at trial run and fractal. So linear regressions uh, can, and logistic regressions can get you to a lot. It's not that every company, data company out there is making use of neural networks and CNN and all of those, um, you know, high uh, advanced level machine learning. A lot of businesses make use of simple uh, algorithms, but they are deployed on scale. They handle a lot of data for a lot of customers, and that is also machine learning. Um, I would love all of you to take a look at uh, this hackathon. I, I will be sharing the links of the slide. So this hackathon specifically uh, was to predict the customer lifetime value, uh, what I've introduced you to. 
and uh, there is a notebook that is attached to this. It, the hackathon is over. It was in February, but uh, the notebooks, the GitHub notebook has been shared already uh, on your emails. This is making use of BigQuery ML, which is just another language for uh, BQML. Uh, you can do this in Python as well, but if you know SQL, you can try to use uh, BigQuery ML to run and understand, uh, you know, how, how audience segmentation works. Uh, the hackathon helps you, uh, you know, go through uh, an entire data set, which is based on Google Analytics. Now, Google Analytics uh, is something that is used by a lot of companies, almost every uh, sporting good or, or grocery store, they would have their websites uh, linked to these Google Analytics and understand, you know, which order came from which particular person, the page uh, pages they visited before clicking add to cart, or maybe they left it on add to cart. So all of the, that data is recorded and Google Analytics is a nested, really complex data set that you have. So do check out this hackathon and you would be uh, really, it, it, it is rewarding to actually go through the, the entire set. Um, you can actually come up with a lot of these different understandings on, you know, which customer falls and under which area, who, who loves hats and, and uh, apparels together. A lot of uh, wonderful uh, outputs can come out of that. So um, feel free to check that out. And, bef and now I'll, I'll be just quickly taking a look at the, I don't see a lot of, yeah. Spam filter, what is a good performance for metric for k-means clustering, especially when we are predicting for unsupervised learning? By performance metric, are you referring to the number of clusters? Uh, so Vivian, if 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 your if your use case is required, say I want three different segments uh, by your team, or you want more than that, uh, you would actually have to talk to your your teammates and find out you know what works best in what scenario. Uh, this is not something that is uh, directly used. You would obviously want to further analyze um, how how this can be actually. Uh, used uh, so maybe you would have further steps after an audience segmentation as well uh, but it helps you understand which customer falls under which segment so uh, because we are able to send emails and targeted marketing campaigns right into their social media feeds there is a lot of uh, uh, work that done that gets done after the segmentation has been uh, found out so if you feel that there are more number of uh, 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 if you want to change your evaluation metrics, you will definitely uh, can reiterate and, and change that as well. So then that, that is a perfect segue. Thank you for that question uh, for our next topic, which is when you try to have uh, data science in scale, uh, these are the different segments. You know, every single uh, uh, company or, or team goes through all of these different stages. That is, like I mentioned, uh, I was working initially as a data engineer. So in this area, the first segment that you see, you would want to uh, go ahead and do all of the ingestion, uh, all of the um, transformation. You would move your data from one place to another place. So perhaps it might be like the one of the greatest missed opportunities in any data science team uh, when data is existing somewhere and when it's not being made accessible for further analysis. So laying that critical foundation for that downstream and systems data engineering is what involves transporting and shaping and, and enriching your data for the purposes of making it available and accessible for uh, proper analysis. So uh, data ingestion, pre-processing, pre storage, cataloging, all of this is possible. Uh, so if you're using any cloud provider, it could be Google Cloud, it could be uh, Azure, or it could be AWS, there are products that help you do uh, this transportation processing and cataloging, but this is the first section that happens, a first stage. Uh, the next stage is the data analysis, where this is where you, trust, you know, start to see the value of data. It might include statistics, it might include visualizations, uh, it might include your, your, you know, understanding, okay, this is what the patterns are within my data set, so I should use, which algorithm should I use? All of those decisions are made in this area. Now, once you've decided what the algorithm should be like and you would develop that model, it could be linear regression to XGBoost from TensorFlow to PyTorch. What are you using uh, to, to back up these, uh, these models? Once It's not just theory, you have to choose which one to use. 
Maybe your teammates do not know PyTorch, they are only family with TensorFlow. You could go and use that. And all of that, you know, the model development stage is where the machine learning starts to provide new ways of unlocking value uh, from your data. Now, experimentation is, is a very strong theme here. Uh, data scientists are going on looking for ways to accelerate iteration speed uh, between those models, and they don't want to really worry about what infrastructure to use, what is the overhead, uh, context switching between tools, and what analysis tools will work better when you're trying to deploy something uh, uh, to production. So that is where MLOps comes into the picture. This is a very uh, hot uh, trend in uh, uh, job opportunity uh, for a lot of people because this is super critical. Uh, MLOps is uh, where ML engineering uh, is basically like when you have a, uh, you know, a satisfactory model that has been developed, the next step is to incorporate all of these activities uh, of a well-engineered application uh, lifecycle, which includes testing, deployment, and monitoring. And all of these activities should be automated and as robust as possible, because though we, we sign up for these jobs, we don't want our lives and our weekends to be ruined. So MLOps is where all of the automation happens and all of the, you know, it helps create those systems. I love that quote that says, um, you know, you don't rise to the to the level of your goals, you, you rise, you fall to the level of your systems by James Clear. So this is where all of that system creation happens and super important. Uh, the next step is once you have all of those, those uh, uh, systems in, in place, you would have a very clear flow from data engineering. The pipeline goes uh, to model development and model is being monitored. You won't want to uh, then visualize the results. And that is where all of the in, uh, insights can be uh, you know, derived and reported from uh, mostly on a dashboard. We can make use of Looker or, or Tableau or based on whatever you're familiar with, you can. Uh, so um, we do not usually come up with, uh, so on when you're working with, at enterprises level, we don't come up with Matplotlib specifically, but uh, uh, you know you can maybe try out on this weekend uh, Tableau and, and bigger dashboard uh, structures, um, tools that help you present your, your understandings and interpretations on a very good dashboard. And the final stage is orchestration, like, which is again, I just wanted to put it out there that, um, you know, that entire pipeline combination of uh, data pipelines, ML pipelines and ML logs has to be monitored and you would have these building blocks uh, as a practical solution uh, application, basically, of all of these have to be automatically maintained and orchestrated uh, so that, you know, when, when your model is in uh, production, it helps you uh, monitor that ML system entirely in a, in a nice way. But you obviously can reiterate, change these building blocks in, in whatever ways you need to based on your requirements. So... Uh, Quickly, this is uh, data extraction, data analysis, preparation, model training. So uh, these are the different stages uh, that come into a picture for any ML project. And as and when you uh, define your business use case, uh, the, the success criteria. So uh, I was working as an AI product manager in a handwriting uh, product. So in, 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 in those areas, you would want to come up with those evaluation metrics as well uh, in the beginning itself. You know, how do you evaluate whether or not your uh, handwriting recognition model is working perfectly or not, for example. So sometimes you would have to come up with uh, not just understanding what the use case is, but also how do I evaluate whether or not my model is working correctly or not? What are my success criteria? Once you have all of that established is when you would you know, want to implement this entire chain. So extract the data, integrate it, and put all of the relevant data from all of the different various sources that you have uh, uh, that required for that ML task. And that is what the extraction is. You would analyze this data, understand the schema behind it, uh, understand and prepare, do a lot of feature engineering, uh, remove uh, pre-processing uh, the data. So uh, the pr preparation is basically, sometimes your model does not really require all of the features that you have in the data set. You can reduce the number of features being sent to your model and reduce the time that it takes to run it. So sometimes your models have to be deployed in edge devices by like, like mobile phones or tablets. The model size itself has to be really small. You might have to undergo a quantization method or there are different methods you can you know, use while you're building that model so that uh, it, is, it is really small in size, but really fast. Uh, so data pre-preparation plays a really important role. Then comes the model training. 
where you all are familiar with that. You can train data on a different data set uh, and keep some data, unseen data for um, the evaluation. So uh, basically that holdout uh, test test set is kept so that you can evaluate the model's quality. Um, then you move on to the validation based on the metrics you've already chosen. Uh, again, if this does not work, you would you would go back and train it differently, test it again. Now, serving the model, it might be uh, different based on different uh, requirements. So like uh, there might be a REST API, there might be an embedded uh, mobile uh, SDK uh, that is being deployed to your mobile devices, or it can be a batch prediction system. So um, Whatever is, is the serving uh, methodology you've used uh, based on your use case, you also need to monitor it, of course, uh, because if it's like, say, a predictive batch prediction system, you would want to uh, make sure that it is uh, being able to uh, take in uh, whatever new batch data you've gotten. So based on the maturity, that, that depends mostly like if you, if let me go to the next slide. Based on the maturity of your team, you would uh, work with either offline data or online data and keep retraining on the fly. So these are the uh, so Google has these uh, different uh, uh, best practices for different uh, MLOP uh, mature based on your majority of your data team. You would be either in level zero, a level one, a level two. So. Um, Basic level of ML, MLOps uh, level zero is where you are working with offline data. You have um, not a lot of releases uh, of your model. Once you have trained the model on offline data, uh, there is not a lot of continuous integration or continuous deployment happening. There is not a lot of monitoring happening. You've just you know, built a model, shipped it, and you know, offered it to your customers. Uh, this is uh, this, this obviously has a lot of challenges as you get more clients. Um, like uh, in, in trial run, we had say one client in the first year, then we had two th or three or four the next year, and then it kept on increasing. So the more number of clients you want to serve, you need to have really good systems in place. So um, there are obviously challenges that happens uh, when you try to, you know, uh, you need to actively monitor the model once it's, uh, the quality of your model once it's in production. And uh, in, the, in that case, you know, it, it helps you change the, the, the performance of your model. So it is not in a stale state. It is work, it's not working on old data. Uh, so it helps you do new experimentations. Uh, your data scientists can actually, um, we can actually make use of uh, new data and, and change our results. So frequently retraining your production models is something that happens uh, to capture the emerging trends and patterns. So you would want to retrain uh, some of your models with the most recent data and continuously experiment uh, based on your implementations. So MLOps 1, that is a level one, this is where there is a pipeline automation happening. So ML pipeline will have, uh, say, um, Continuous testing, continuous integration. Uh, you can trigger uh, based on your, uh, you know, availability of your data. You can actually trig, uh, set a trigger for your pipeline to be okay. There is new data. Let me pull that data, uh, send it through all of those stages of preparation and cleaning, and uh, building of the model, training of the model, and evaluation. Like it, it re-triggers the entire pipeline that you have in place uh, based on your, uh, uh, you know, your availability. We'll say, let's say. There is a new data that has come up, say, um, every week or, say, every fourth week. It, it can be a batch trigger, but that also can re-trigger your entire pipeline. So this is something that can be used uh, based on the maturity of your uh, data team's uh, uh, level of understanding and access and, and budget. There's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind, yeah. Uh, but once that is in place, a lot of things are, are solved for you. Uh, uh, data mo model val validation is taken care of. You can you can add test cases for this. You can make sure that your distributions are intact. Um, if there is an issue, you can go ahead and change it. So there's a lot of uh, plug and play without changing the rest of your pipeline. You can you can you know just change uh, in individual building blocks. And the final uh, MLOps level uh, two is uh, basically focusing on. A very robust system. You have auto build and auto test. Uh, so in in like when you're trying to build this in scale, uh, you would want to make sure that it is completely orchestrated. Um, you can for so for example, I have um, an, another blog written on this uh, that is me. I made use of uh, Composer, which is um, 
Airflow. It is open source. Uh, and it's, it's not just that Airflow can be used. You can make use of Vertex AI or I'm, I'm referring to things that are within Google Cloud, but that does not mean that it does not exist in uh, Microsoft or uh, Amazon. There are definitely a lot of uh, tools that you can use. And the Airflow is open source. So Airflow makes you, helps you write these DAGs that can, you know, schedule different uh, elements of your, of your pipeline. Say, for example, I want to ingest data from a public source every day, say weather data. Uh, you can actually write a DAG to uh, get that data and you don't need to do, you don't need to even go to that particular cloud system where this is happening. You can just write a, a very simple Python script and it would be running for you at the, uh, at the very second that you can decide. So there are a lot of uh, uh, implementations, uh, detail that I can go into and trying, I, I think maybe we should write a blog on that. Um, but there is um, definitely one version of this written already on Medium. And if you're uh, interested, I've also included this link to, it's a very detailed uh, tutorial by Google developer advocates themselves. So please do check out that in detail. Uh, it's, it's I have I didn't want to show a lot of these images, but there are uh, in detail architecture images for MLOps one, zero, one, and two. Uh, definitely check that out. And if you're in Bangalore, there is a talk happening on the same topic uh, by one of my friends. So I thought I'll just put it out there at the Great India Developer Summit. So any questions? We are yeah, moving. Some... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We have questions. Okay. Um, Anshu has asked, uh, what is a must known, I think it's known tool in data science. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to break it to you. Tools keep changing. Uh, there are, you would have a new tool now, oh, thanks to chat, chat GPT and the implementations of that. You would have a lot of tools coming up in the, in the market, uh, for a lot of, uh, use cases. Um, one tool for, for cleaning, one another tool for monitoring, another tool for dashboard. So it actually keeps varying, but I would uh, recommend, uh, I would highly encourage you not to get disheartened if you can't keep up with all of that. None of us can. It is, it is overwhelming. Uh, so there is no one best tool, but I would recommend uh, being strong on your foundations. Uh, so for even for the past uh, so many years, you know, SQL hasn't changed. If you know SQL, you can actually make use of BigQuery ML as well. So uh, once your concepts are clear, uh, whatever you're reading, whatever books you're reading, ISLR or uh, the, those things that help you clear out your concepts, these new tools, they would not take you more than a day or two or a few uh, video tutorials on YouTube to understand how that particular tool works. But but your foundations and your and your understanding and concepts that does not change. The tools might change tomorrow uh, of how to use a certain uh, a certain concept, but that does not actually uh, uh, you know it should not uh, discourage you from trying out data science. So though it keeps changing, uh, feel free to experiment. You know it, things don't break. Your your laptop is not going to break into pieces. Like experiment the hell out of all of the new tools that you find out. Um, is I I think I missed some a few questions seem to be evaporated. Okay, okay, they've gone into the answered section. Okay, um, okay. K can K N N handle both categorical and numerical data? So I think um, so unless you. I think there is a possibility if you just do uh, convert the categoricals into, uh, uh, you know, do the one hot encoding and, and dummy, add, add dummy values, you can make use of uh, in integers mostly. Uh, but um, I, I think it's possible to do that categorically. I'll, I'll get back to you if, I, if I'm wrong. I don't want to spread incorrect information here uh, or, or people on the panel can also answer. Uh, but if I think it mostly works with int integers. Um, I also did answer the KPI one, unless I didn't. Uh, please let me know. I think the KPI one has also been answered. Um, say for customer segmentation, I guess the metrics can be to see if this improves the sales after segmenting. Yes, yes, you're right. So uh, you can keep understanding uh, what are your different segments and uh, come up with those recommendations on say for uh, uh, your based on Another, let's let's take another example. Say you found that a set of new students are attending on uh, mostly in the months of September. 
So do you want to have, say, another financial aid program being uh, recommended to them on your website? Maybe a lot more people are clicking on that. So based on your use case, uh, based on uh, you would have a different understanding of, you know, maybe I need to have a, uh, another segment being created for this. So, uh, of course, your metrics can change. Uh, uh, if your sales are not improving, you would want to uh, make sure that you are evaluating it. So there's always a relearn and reiteration that keeps happening. Um, sorry, I think that's done. Great presentation. How frequently do you need to tune your models in production? As often as you can, not really. Uh, so it depends on the use case again. Now, if you don't have uh, real-time data coming to you, uh, so for example, streaming data uh, requires you to make use of uh, PubSub or, or different tools that will help you get the data on a, on a real-time basis. So if, if that's not your case, you would have batch data. Now, batch data can, so in, in retail, you would have maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, every Monday, <laughs> depending on your team's uh, working schedule, uh, you would have new data coming into the picture and you would want your models to actually make use of that. So uh, if this system is in place, uh, like I was mentioning, like in, in, in 2018, we, we had these PySpark script jobs. We would uh, you know go through that entire pipeline every week so uh, it depends on your use case uh, if it is a real time one it would just keep on happening uh, as and when data comes but uh, the triggers can be decided uh, by your team and by the use case i hope that answers um, what is the platform or the app that you use to track the performance of the model um, so here in this case you would uh, have so if you if you're familiar with vertex ai vertex ai pipelines give you the entire dashboard on, okay, what has been your accuracy levels like? What has been your uh, failure rate like? And there is a lot that Vertex AI uh, helps you uh, answer. So that's what I'm familiar with, but obviously other, other clouds have their own versions of it. Can you give an example for a practical implementation of orchestration of MLOps pipelines and MLOps too? So like I mentioned, um, orchestration usually happens uh, using tools like Cloud Composer uh, or Airflow. Uh, you can also make use of uh, the artifact registry. So if you're using Docker, you would want to make use of artifact registry within Google Cloud where you can change the images. Uh, and, and these are just things that are helping you automate and, and save your time on your weekends. So uh, there is, there's, uh, and I would highly recommend going through this particular uh, blog. It's not a blog, it's like an entire tutorial for uh, the cloud architecture that you would want to present. So uh, it's, 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 it's I, I think I'll, I'll have to write five blogs to, you know, capture all of that that has been mentioned in this tutorial. I recommend going through that because there are reference architectures that you can use and implement as it is for your team, uh, if it's a small team or, or if it's a big team, based on the maturity levels, you can use that. Is there any way we can access MLOps workshop if we are not based in Bangalore? I have requested for uh, the video tutorials and if I do find them, I will share it with our with Steam. Um, what are your thoughts on Mage AI? And I, uh, I am doing Mage AI. I am doing research in insurance fraud and planning to use Mage AI over Airflow. I haven't uh, unfortunately used Mage AI. I've only used Airflow. So, um, Give it a try. I do not find, uh, like, you know, don't be biased at all that because you've heard Airflow on, on, in this workshop, you should only use Airflow. Feel free to use uh, Astronomer or there are a lot of different tools for orchestration there um, that we keep trying to have in, uh, integrations within Google Cloud. Uh, our, our main job was trying to figure out, you know, what are the open source tools that are being used? So uh, feel free to give it a try and uh, let us, uh, you know, maybe discuss this out, you know, which one worked better. So there is no harm in finding out what works and what doesn't work. And I think I am out of time, but uh, yeah. feel free to go through this entire PPT. I've just added a few career roles that you can choose to be a part of uh, the data team. Wherever you are joining, uh, feel free to, you know, don't on only look for data scientist. There is a lot of different roles on LinkedIn. Uh, look out for jobs like Tableau expert or MLOps and data architect. And there's a there's a wide variety of things that you can, you know, check out. Um, and feel free to please give me feedback. Uh, I would love to improve my uh, presentation skills. And, and 9 a.m. You know, I've spoken too fast or, or did not, if you did not find any meaning to it, feel free to tell me all of that in the feedback form here. 
Also, uh, I, there is a blog version of this entire talk on uh, my medium that is this here. So uh, I think Laura will be sharing uh, that here or maybe can you share it in the chat. Absolutely, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, Julian for your workshop and for taking the time today to just share a, a wealth of knowledge. And I'd also like to thank the audience for your engagement. It makes these workshops maximally enriching, I would say. So Julian has graciously uh, volunteered to answer remaining questions um, in the Q&A or in the chat just by typing them out. And we are so grateful for her time. Thank you again.